Your solution to designing products that appeal to women without alienating men is a process called gender blend design. What is it, and why is it successful? I think for us, because we work together and we're married together, and it's really been that way for over 20 years, gender blending for us was sort of natural, but we realized how to we use coined that the to phrase. our advantage, right? Yeah. We just coined the phrase a few years ago, but it, it's a description of how we've always worked. Right. I mean, at first it sort of started as, you know, kind of like complementary um, skills, mm. you know, textiles and color materials and finishes and industrial design and engineering and function. And, you know, that that seemed to be a good marriage of skills. And, of course, personally, we just enjoyed working together, so that helped as well. But it got to be a competitive advantage both for us as designers and for our clients, and it got to be making better products, too. I mean, it, 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 we certainly came out with a unique perspective on, on um, the various products that we um, ha- were assigned over the years. But I think that the big thing about it is is that is that what gender blending represents is really just this wonderful marriage between male and male and female consumer needs. So you can't always see that when you're designing in a bubble. And so because we design mm-hmm. as a team, it works for us. It's been painfully obvious with companies we've worked with over the years who don't have any women on their yeah. design staffs um, or even the ones that do the environment at those companies just does not allow for an open and honest debate to right. take place about what is going to be successful, what the consumer wants. Yeah, and, you know, especially when debate heads to, uh, you know, gender argument. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you can't, it sounds sexist. And, you know, sometimes you're saying these things like, women don't want this. And I almost hate myself for saying that. But at the same time, if somebody's not out there saying that, then that perspective's not being heard. So if you're holding it back, like I always think of that funny um, scene in the movie, um, What Women Want it, with Mel, Mel Gibson. Yeah, yeah. And he's, they're sitting around and they're talking about, I don't know, Tylenol oh. or uh, some ibuprofen, uh, you know, or something like oh, that. I, I and the woman that. thinks in her head, yeah, but, you know, sometimes I take it to fake a headache. And she thinks that, but she doesn't say it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's what happens is that even when you do have a group where there's men and women together, there's self-censoring going on because the guy doesn't want to appear sexist about it and he doesn't want to say on something that might get him in HR trouble. And women don't want to appear as women. I mean, a lot of times, especially when you're advocating for needs of moms, the last thing you want is to make your boss aware of the fact that you are a mom because then in the back of his head, well, uh, you might she's go gonna, on maternity leave. Yeah. You know. She's going to check out. And she's going to be home to get take her kids to soccer. She's not that serious about this job. And you don't want that when you're up for a promotion. So th- it happens whether you want it to or not, that sort of self-censoring. So we've developed it a way in which because we can be completely honest with each other and the, the sexism is, I guess, acceptable in our workplace, <laughs> for lack of a better way well, to say but it. But what I would say is that all of our interests are completely aligned right. and there isn't the competition or the concern of perception right. that exists in every corporate environment. Right. <clears throat> I think also that there's the issue that, you know, the there's not a lot of, um, uh, at, while there's a big strong interest in attention to what women want because Everyone knows the demographics that 85% of all retail purchases are, are bought or influenced by women. So at an executive level throughout the company, at a sales level, at a buyer level, everyone accepts that and understands that. How you do it and whether or not you're willing to take the risk and say that that's the idea is really, really difficult at a corporate level. Mm-hmm. And so it's a little too easy to default to what you know as a male executive is safe or you've done is past history and so those kinds of things all are a factor in whether or not that that uh, the needs of women and the desires of women consumers are represented and you know it's one of those things where in our case we have a strong history of having successful products so that it's easier for us to do it than other people but we also have sort of the two of us as a dynamic of making the presentation and saying women like this and men like this and it you know you have both sides at the same time saying the same message and I think that that get you know lends a lot of credibility to the designs that we present at any given time well it's more believable I think especially for upper level executives in a corporation who 
if their internal teams were to say, hey, we need to really do this differently in order to increase our sales to get more women to buy the products, they may have trouble buying it. And maybe those executives would rather retreat to what they know, what they're comfortable with. And that's what sold last year. But they don't realize this may be the key to selling even more and better right. than they have in the past. And we've seen that, as you said, with examples. Yeah, we have products that have done exactly that. So the other thing about it is is that is that you know a lot of times you, you'll have a... Um, as an in-house designer, they'll present a design idea and it'll be great and it represents female consumer desires. Maybe they've even focus group tested it, which, you know, it inherently has its own problems. But, you know, you come to this point in which you're presenting something and the, and the question is as well, you know, I think if we do this, it's a niche. And <laughs> they get caught up in the idea that designing for one gender is a niche. But when that gender is 85% of their sales, they have to seriously tamp that down and say that is non-issue and take the risk. But they don't. Although, I mean, gender blending is about meeting the needs and appealing to both genders. Right. right? Yeah, we shouldn't discount the fact that it goes the other way as well. I mean, we see a lot of men... Uh, male influence on female friendly products like you know traditionally female friendly products and I may have mentioned that I'm not a vacuumer but <laughs> that I don't do the vacuuming but it, it there are a lot of men who do and so all of a sudden the vacuum has changed it's become more manly it's you know it's become a power it's a power tool home, right? yeah. yeah exactly so that dynamic changes because you know who wants to be vacuuming with a pink vacuum or you know a purple one it, they want something that you know looks like a tool that it is so it, it's changed in and of itself that because there's a lot more participative homes, that there are, you know, participative genders, that there's a lot of that going on as well. So it does go both ways. Mm -hmm.